All right, now, everybody. Quiet, listen to me. We're going to start a show. Now, some of you people have been with me before. You know it's going to be a tough grind. But we're going to have a show. And hello, all. Great to have you all in the mix. Yes, thank you. Albert is here today, everyone. Albert, thank the you. commissioner is in his chair. And Kim, of course, in her Kim, chair how are you? off of the uh, Nikki show. And I am here with my credibility glasses firmly on my face. We have so much to do today. What? It's really a cool show. The New Hampshire primary over. Brother John Rothman will be here bottom of the hour, and we will x-ray that. The future, the future both for Trump, who may wrap up this nomination earlier than any other candidate in modern history, and the future for Nikki Haley, who will likely stay in the race, I would think, through her home state of South Carolina, although she's not polling well in her home state. Uh... Also have uh doesn't she kind of have to stay in the race? Because what if she gets thrown in jail? What if he gets thrown in jail? We well, he's not, gonna, he's not gonna get game. thrown in jail. <laughs> All right. Listen, go back to Libby Libby Libville, where you guys tell yourselves the lies about my Jesus, Donald J. Trump. Woohoo! Yeah. All I have to say, MAGA Mickey and I have one message for you, Kim. <laughs> Yeah, Trump 2024, exactly. Trump for jail is what There's I have There's never been say. anything like this. That's right. Trump Stand for by. President Orange. woo People who should be in jail aren't in jail. People who shouldn't be in jail are in jail. That is America, everyone. I mean, that states it a little starkly, but you get the idea. I have news I just want to quickly share. Then Ben Mankiewicz is going to join us from TCM, Turner Classic Movies, to talk about the passing what? of Norman Jewison. Norman Jewison is a significant director in both cinematic terms, that is to say the impact he had on the film industry and his movies, but also in the social conscience associated with his movies. He did um, In the Heat of the Night, probably one of the most famous movies he did was In the Heat of the Night. He did Fiddler on the Roof. He did Moonstruck. Moonstruck. That was the share movie, right? Share movie, exactly. Yeah. And Cincinnati Kid, he did that too. So um, anyway, Ben will be along in a moment. Before Ben gets here, I wanted to mention something else. That, oh, and, and I mentioned Rothman as well. I've got a great That's Rich segment and a great Law and Disorder segment. And I even have a Bowling with Biden segment. So that's a warning to Albert because I don't even think I told you I had a, a Bowling with Biden. We'll have... All of that in today's show. Our cup runneth over. The Mark Thompson Show. I think one of the most disturbing trends in America and one of the most disturbing trends worldwide is playing out right now in Los Angeles. I'm talking about the loss of newspapers and journalism. The LA Times and their editorial page does lean liberal, okay? So there's no... And you can even say, well, they're a bunch of libs. They're super libs in their editorial page. Great. Okay, that's the editorial page. That's not the rest of the paper. And, I mean, even if it did, I, I, it, that might be a different conversation. But my point is they are a brilliant group of journalists. And they've done Pulitzer Prize winning work. I just remember the huge piece they did on the DDT dumping that the military did off the coast of Southern California. There's miles of it. That was a story that was unknown until the LA Times broke it. And I was think she won the, the Pulitzer for it. Was that the one off Catalina Island? Yes. Thank yeah. you, off Catalina Island. I mean, acres and acres and acres of these barrels. They're just metal barrels. They're all corroded. And there's DDT in it. I mean toxifying all that marine environment there. I mean, that's just one. There, you, you go back to the history of the LA Times, they've done great, great work. They've exposed huge scandals in the legal industry recently, just in the last year. Anyway, the LA Times... We have our Michael Hiltzik uh, with the LA Times, right? Right, he's the... Look at all uh, the good work he does, over and over and over again, exposing things. Yes, Hiltzik is great. I actually was going to... Ask him to maybe come in next week to talk about this a little bit. Because, do you understand, this isn't just the LA Times. It's playing out at the LA Times. But there is 
not money in any of these newspapers to maintain staff on the level that will continue any sort of momentum when it comes to journalism. Investigative pieces, even just basic journalism, is going to be completely undermined by the fact that there just isn't the money there. People aren't reading the paper, the new generation doesn't read the paper, and digital media is gobbling up all of these great institutions of journalism. So in the LA Times case, 115 journalists have been fired. And it's 20% of the newsroom, a little north of 20% of their newsroom. The 142-year-old newspaper reading from this piece, which has one of the largest print circulations in the United States, has also lost its executive editor and managing editor in recent weeks. It hits me square in the heart. Don't we need journalists to have a healthy democracy? We need information. And so you're right. We need journalists. And you need journalists to speak truth to power. And essentially that's being undermined across the board. They had a day-long walkout on Friday. The union did in Los Angeles there at the LA Times. And the reason they did is they were trying to essentially communicate to Dr. Patrick Soon Shong, who's the paper's owner. He's a billionaire who took over the LA Times, that he he should reconsider this planned staff layoff, but it, it didn't work. And here's the other thing and the reason I mentioned this story to you off the beginning of the show. Uh, for the reasons that Kim noted, you do need a solid press to continue the information flow to the democracy, to the people who vote, the populace, right? The, but what you're seeing in Los Angeles, you're seeing across the board in America. Small yeah. papers are going away. But even the big papers, you could say, well, the New York Times seems to be doing well. They have, the New York Times is really an exception because even in the case of the Washington Post, this is a massive paper with giant award-winning journalists working there. They are losing money. They lost $100 million last Ooh, year. Ouch. So LA Times, Washington Post, these are bellwethers for an industry that is going south. And you can say, well, I mean, Dr. Patrick Soon Shong, who owns the LA Times, he's a billionaire. You know, Jeff Bezos, who owns the Washington Post, he's a billionaire. Yeah, this just in. Billionaires don't like losing money, even if they've got it to lose. Mm. And they literally are slashing in ways that may threaten the life of the LA Times. The paper itself is already, you know, a shadow of what it was. This has already happened in cities across the country, says Norm, and the politicians love it. Maybe, maybe, certainly incumbent politicians may like it. If you take away different points of view, through information, then you take away our freedom and critical thinking, says Vilma. Yeah, I mean, this is why the information is so very important. They say here young journalists of color were disproportionately affected by the layoffs. Oh. Many black, Asian Americans, and Latino staffers losing their jobs. And again, when Soon Shang, the family, came in, billionaire, he had... Really, he was a rescue. It was a, I mean, he really did rescue that paper. And there was a sense that this guy has a social conscience and a commitment to journalism, and he's got deep pockets. So he can, he doesn't have to make the money that the last ownership did. But again, you look at the bottom line and, you know, how many hundreds of millions of dollars does even a billionaire want to lose? So I think this is big, big news. Yeah. It's a massive story. And again, it's, it's a grim story when you see what's happening with mass layoffs, closures. And there's something else they, they call reader fatigue, where you're inundated by so much news that you begin to just tune out and you don't go to even the digital presence like, let's say, the LA Times has. Hey, you saw what happened at Sports Illustrated. Yep. That was a billionaire who said, eh, I'm just closing it down. Sports Illustrated. I mean, that's a, again, I'm, we're talking about brands that have tremendous reputations. The LA Times has a tremendous reputation. What a brand. Yeah. 
But, you know, in this critical election year in which there'll be a lot of disinformation, we're losing major papers. Now you're getting this, you know, AI generated stuff. You can't tell whether it's real or fake. And the public discourse is going to be perverted by this, I think. Uh, and at the in the small communities all around the country, I think you're really going to notice this as well. Uh, the San Jose Merc, what was that? I missed oh. it. Uh, it's just about quality of, of newspapers. And I, I've seen this as well as far as different newspapers and how they used to be staffed and have editors. And now there's mistakes all over the place. And, and you know, stories about a real estate listing instead of like hard hitting news because they don't have the staff to cover things. Blue Spark says the San Jose Mercury paper edition is getting weird. Misspellings, duplicate articles, Sunday features repeated every day. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I get the digital version of the of the Merc, so I don't know what the mm -hmm. what the actual paper looks like. Um, I, I think these journalists know a lot, so I know that there's a hater in the um, in the chat who's saying, uh, you know, that that they don't. But the reality is, I think these journalists who work hard at the Washington, you're telling me the Washington Post, L.A. Times guys, these are these are award winning journalists, dude. I mean, you, you just don't talk out of your butt when you're talking about these guys. I mean, it's really it, it's. These are sad times when the information you'll be getting is going to be, you know, what, off of Breitbart? I mean, mm. come on. So uh, the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Boston Globe, Sports Illustrated, um, there's, a, there's a digital presence from all of these brands. The Washington Post and L.A. Times looked like they were going to make comebacks, but now it really is a, it's a rough ride for print journalism. Anyway, uh, important and a huge layoffs at the LA Times and I wanted you to know about it. The Mark Thompson Show. I um, I read with some sadness about the passing of Norman Jewison. And uh, Norman Jewison, an incredibly important director from the standpoint, I guess, both of the film industry and also of the social causes that he seemed touched by. I asked Ben Mankiewicz from Turner Classic Movies to join us for just a couple of minutes to talk about Norman Jewison. He passed away at 97, and uh, Ben agreed uh, last minute to be here. So how about it for Ben Mankiewicz, everybody? <laughs> Hi there, Ben. Hey, how are you? Uh, can you All guys right, hear? thank, I thank you. Computer. I'm making sure everything's working, but you can hear me. I'm good. Yeah. Uh, Albert, are you, are you good with Ben right now? Albert is the, uh, is the grand poobah on this show. Yeah, I'll just Are be you, writing his levels. You sound great, Ben. All right. All right. Albert, thank you. All right. Uh, ben, Norman Jewison, I think of him in the heat of the night, uh, Cincinnati kid. Uh, he was important. Fiddler on the roof, I guess. There he is. Tell me about the impact of Norman Jewison. Who was he as a director? Well, I think his impact is, uh, you know, considerable. He came into the business a, a little bit before the new Hollywood, which, you know, for all intents and purposes started in 1967. Uh, you know, the Cincinnati kid came before that. He, he did a couple of Doris Day movies, but the Cincinnati kid was really a breakthrough uh, for him. You know, I don't think he gets in the heat of the night, which was 1967, one of the seminal films of 67 um, uh, without the Cincinnati kid. You know, there's a he famously told Hal Ashby, who was one of the great directors of the 1970s, Hal Ashby had seven films in nine years. They're all really top tier pictures. Uh, and Ashby was Norman's editor. And I, I Ashby flamed out in part because he used a tremendous amount of drugs <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. in part because he couldn't reconcile dealing with the people who had the money with producers with suits right and and basically what norman had said to hal was you know always remember the you know the suits are our enemy but norman like martin scorsese like a little bit later steven spielberg you know he figured it out he figured out how to maintain this independent voice and stand up for movies and stories that he believed in without blowing himself up and how Ashby had an unbelievable seven picture run over nine years, but he couldn't, he couldn't pull himself to get along 
with the people who were going to hire him and pay him. And so Norman had this gift because he was such a gentle, wonderful man. I interviewed him a number of times, really long form interviews, spent a long time with him, had meals with him. And he was just so kind. And, you know, he, he like had the, he had the brain and heart of a radical, but the sensibility to figure out like, Hey man, I'm making movies and I, I'm going to have to work for these studios at some point. So, um, he was sort of an exception in that he, he figured it out. And it's one of the things I really admired about him. In the heat of the night was a film and is a film. That's one of the great things about film is that it just endures. So it's still there and it, it's impactful today. There was a bunch of stuff I saw in the heat of the night, you know, many years ago, but then I saw it again at one of your festivals, the TCM festival and Sidney Poitier, who's, you know, critical part in the film, obviously lead in the movie, uh, he was there, and I just was again reminded of how breakthrough that movie was in so many different ways. And it took, even as it took head on, uh, the issue of racism in the South. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, the the film was in a significant breakthrough film. Hang on a second, uh, Albert. That is in the heat of the night. The TV show. Okay, that's a picture of the TV show. There's in the heat of the night with Sidney Poitier, Rod Steiger. You want yeah. the film? Sorry, mm-hmm. Ben. Lee Grant. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. Cool. Albert, thank you. Okay, <laughs> right. <laughs> that Go was, ahead. That was uh, Harold Rollins and Carol O'Connor in the TV show, which was, of course, successful and because the movie had been so successful. So, I mean, it's, sure. the, the, the television show grew out of that. Um, and uh, so 1967, you know, this was, uh, you know, uh, the heat and heart of the civil rights movement. Um, and, you know, there, there were there were certainly some really thoughtful people who had some criticism of the movie, like James Baldwin, who thought, you know, this portrayal of a, of a, a northern black man in the South is preposterous, I think were the, was the words James Baldwin used. But that said, the movie was a breakthrough film. I, I think it's really quite amazing to watch today. Uh, you know, white people took this story of, you know, friendship that, hey, look, can't we all get along, which is what we always wanted to take from these movies. Like, everything will be fine. Right. I think black people saw these movies a little differently, quite understandably. But nonetheless, there's still some real breakthrough moments of it. The the real hero of the story is Poitier, right, who's in the South visiting family um, uh, when he is suddenly accused of committing this murder in this small town merely because he's a black guy in a suit in town. And then it turns out he's a skilled, but he's the smartest person in every room he's in, right? He knows a lot more about investigating murders because he's a homicide detective in Philadelphia and, and things are fairly primitive in this small town. And, and, and Rod Steiger as the, as the chief of police there, you know, eventually comes to be, very begrudgingly accept him. But the most powerful moment in the film involves Poitier and another actor, a guy named Larry Gates, character actor, uh, and and he's the big powerful landowner. He doesn't like being talked to during the investigation the way Poitier is talking to him. Poitier plays Virgil Tibbs, and and uh, and Gillespie is there, the Rod Steiger character. And he and then get Larry Gates, this powerful business owner, wealthy man in town, he slaps Poitier. And I always describe it like this: Poitier returns the slap, which he worked on with Norman Jewison, right? And uh, and Poitier was like, "Don't," Jewison told him, "Don't slap him in the ear." Slap him in the face, right? Make sure you get the face. Um, and two things I love about that. One, I always describe it as there's no, you can't on a stopwatch record the limited amount of time it takes for Poitier to return the slap. It's not like, bam, bam, it's bam, bam. Right, Poitier's like, oh, you slap me, I'm gonna slap you back harder. And and Gates then turns to, to Gillespie, the chief of police uh, played by Steiger, and he says, like, did you see that? And Steiger is just looking as, you know, such a good actor and his eyes are wide. And he's like, I saw it. Like, he was just like, I've never seen anything like it. And, and Poitier, you know, the, he ste- of course he steals the scene. He steals every scene. Uh, another great scene with the wonderful actress, Lee Grant. Well, Norman Jewison really, Lee Grant tweeted about this uh, after his death. She was blacklisted, as I, I guess I understand. And, and, and she, she, this was her return after being blacklisted. She was really blacklisted because her husband had been a communist. And, uh, and because the, her, uh, uh, Arnold Manhoff was her husband, Arnie Manhoff and, uh, Diana Manhoff is her daughter and from, uh, you know, uh, soap, I think, right. She was so great on soap. And, uh, but Lee, um, there's a scene where her husband is the murder victim in he of the night. And there's a scene with her and Poitier. They're, they're in the chief's office. There's two of them. 
He's trying to talk to her, get some information, early stages of the murder investigation. She's trying to reconcile that her husband has been murdered. And he wants to touch her to comfort her. But there's this, it's uns, all of it's unspoken. He knows he can't really touch her because he's a black man in the South in 1967. She's not only a white woman, she's a white woman of privilege. And she kind of wants to be comforted, but she's not comfortable letting him touch. And she's also just freaking out. And the two of them being such incredibly skilled actresses, actors, um, it's just a really great 85 second scene. Right. I mean, it's as good as acting gets. And there really aren't that many words exchanged. Um, it's, it's, by the way, you, 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 you uh, I love that you underscore that because just like the slap, the movie's made up of these inflection moments, you know. Right. And by the way, the slap, I learned this, I think, at your festival, the TCM festival. That was Poitier in the moment reacting to it. That wasn't in the script originally. I believe that's right. Norman said otherwise. Norman said okay. that was in the script and so I, I would i would defer to norman they, they certainly worked on it i mean you know memories okay. on this kind of thing first of all we could find out by the scripts are available but you know norman remembers talking about it working on it with potier that kind see, of okay. would have taken place yeah whether whoever whose ever idea it was the notion that potier in 1967 before i don't know exactly when it was shot you know maybe late 66 would have said i'm going to slap this guy i actually find hard to believe but if anybody would have done that it was Poitier and uh you know he's one you know, he made three movies that year Poitier did uh, in the heat of the night guess who's coming to dinner and to serve with love he was not nominated for best actor but if they gave the award for best year right he got the <laughs> well and, and the other the five just I want 1967 is like maybe the greatest year for best actors Poitier wasn't nominated and then there's Paul Newman and Cool Hand Luke and Dustin Hoffman and the graduate and Warren Beatty in Bonnie and Clyde and Spencer Tracy in Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and Rod Steiger in The Heat of the Night Who Won. Well, and you mentioned The Graduate. The Graduate is what took the director's Oscar, if you want to put it this way, from Norman Jewison that you were talking about. He was nominated against Mike Nichols, who won for The Graduate that year. Yeah, and any, um, any, any of those directors of those movies I just mentioned really, really could have won. You know, sure. Thank uh, you. Yeah. It's really unbelievable. That's why the that. Oscars are just what they are. You know, I mean, it's tough to compare this stuff. Uh, by the way, Norman Jewison was not Jewish. Boy, that's the best part about it. I mean, that's the best story about Norman is the, so like in what? 19, United, <laughs> Heart, United Artists hires him to, uh, to direct Fiddler on the Roof, right? Which had been this unbelievably wildly successful Broadway play and then international play. And then finally they're going to turn it into a movie and they can't quite figure out how you're going to turn this into a movie. And they, and they hire, they're like, well, Norman Jewish, <laughs> he'll be able to, the guy didn't need it. <laughs> He's at the meeting. I think Arthur Krim was the head of United artists. I hope I have the name right there. And they're <laughs> there. And Norman realizes some minutes into the meeting and he's like, hmm, you know, fellas, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> I'm just named Jewish. Just a name in Canada. You know, he's Canadian. Norman. He was Methodist. The yeah, family was Methodist. And, and they, he, yeah, they, go they, ahead. He, they, he acted like they were like, oh, no, of course we know that. But he's like, hey, <laughs> I definitely, definitely thought I was Jewish. Yeah. yeah. That's great. He says that like a lot of his childhood because of that name was informed by you know intense prejudice and anti-semitism you know even though yeah. he was not and and yeah he uh, said he totally experienced it and he, and he was always so great about it because he, he always made it clear like the anti-semitism i experienced made me perhaps more sensitive to it more understanding of it that maybe a kid might have been i hope i'd have been that way obviously it wasn't the same as actually being jewish like he was always like i'm not you know i'm not telling you i suffered in that way but i i caught a, a glimpse of it even in canada uh, as we finish up, he did Moonstruck with Cher. I mean, he did quite, there was a breadth of work there in Norman Jewison's cinematic life, right? Oh, yeah. He was, he was like, he's like Howard Hawks. He's like Michael Curtiz, this guy, they could, any kind of movie. He just knew how to tell a story that would relate to people. Um, I tell one quick Moonstruck story. Please. So one of the great things about Moonstruck is one of my favorite movies. A lot of, I mean, it's hard to watch Moonstruck and not love it. Like moment after moment after moment. It just feels so incredibly authentic, right? It's unbelievable cast from, you know, the Theodore Chaliapin, who plays the grandfather to, you know, to obviously Olympia Dukakis won an Oscar and the aunts and uncles, you know, Julie Babasso and Louis Gus, all, all these guys. And uh, 
Um, so, uh, but we're uh, Vincent Gardenia as, as Cher's mom, Cher's father. Um, and uh, so, <laughs> but the movie, like the studio knows it's good, right? They're sure they got a hit. It's funny. They got Jewish and he's at his strength that Cher, they got Cher to do it. She didn't want to do it because she'd been so busy. She insisted on Nicolas Cage. Everything's perfect. The casting, everything is ideal. John Mahoney's go great in this movie too. And then, but in the beginning of the movie, we're meeting the family, this extended family lives in Brooklyn. And uh, we don't, um, and for whatever reason, through the first half hour of the movie, this movie, the studio knows is funny. Jewison knows, everyone knows it's funny and they're screening it and they don't get any laughs. And they're like, we're never this wrong. We know it's good. We see it. We're good. It's funny. And the movie opera plays a big part of the movie, like the passion of opera. And that's what brings Cage and Cher together. They go to the opera on a date. And But they're playing opera music at the beginning of the movie, right? Because it makes sense. Um, and and But the opera music, as these family was trading insults, which are funny, told them that maybe it wasn't supposed to be funny. Like maybe this was a family that had deep-seated anger at each other. And so they weren't laughing. And the only thing they changed was they took that opera music out of the beginning and they replaced it after those test screenings. That's why test screenings matter. And it's not just, you know, somebody saying to Pablo Picasso, hey, too much blue, Pablo. You know, it's not, right? right. It has value. All they do is take that out and replace it with uh, Dean Martin doing that some more. And that little change, they screen it again, every laugh lands, it becomes this giant. Wow. Huge hit. Um, because it telegraphed that no, this is like this is okay. She's not really actually angry at her father in law. She loves that's it. Yeah. wild. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. Well, those kinds of anecdotes and more from the great Ben Mankowitz. By the way, Albert, how can Ben hear me right now without wearing these huge headphones that I'm forced to wear? He looks so good. And, you know, he's got the great hair and everything, and you can see it without headphones because he's not... Wh what are you using to be able to hear me right now, Ben? I'm just hearing it through the computer. I got this new computer, and I don't even think this mic is that I'm talking into, this very expensive microphone. No, it's not working. Yeah, you're, you're, not, we're hearing you. Yeah. It's yeah. not working because I, I haven't got it, I don't know, somehow set up, and your your yeah. your link is new. But I, this, they figured this out on the on the Zooms and the, on the Zoom. I other. see. You don't wow. have to have it. You can hear it without getting the feedback. I think you may have helped me with a breakthrough here. I've got to, um, we are going to change this. I don't like the big heavy cans. But uh, uh, come back and uh, mention your podcast, and we can talk more about that, which I think is a really a cool thing. It's the called. The episode that dropped yesterday, Talking Pictures, with the uh, episode one was Nancy Myers. Yesterday's uh, uh, Steven Soderbergh, just talking about wow. the movies they've made and the movies they love. It's great. Great it's stuff. Great. Yeah. What? It's a great. Yeah, great podcast. So we'll come back and talk more about that. Thanks, Ben Mankiewicz. Thank you, guys. Rest in peace, Norman Jewison. The Mark Thompson Show. Yeah, really a... Um... I do have a setup, by the way, Mark, without any headphones also. No, yeah. so I'm really in the Stone Age with my... I had my headphones set up right now. I do, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just set it up through a speaker. So, yeah, I also don't yeah. like to wear the headphones. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um... Maybe you should have dyed your hair, uh, MT, says M. Oak. Great interview. So there you go. That's from Angela Silva. Come on, Angela Silva. Thank you for that. Um, ben Mankiewicz is terrific, says Eileen. His comments on the film shown on TCM always enlighten and enrich the viewer experience. He really is. Really cool that he spent a couple of minutes of, uh, with us off the top of the show. So, Albert, I ask you what we should do. I've got uh, Brother Rothman waiting. There's a lot of political news. I've got Trump stuff. I've got Nikki Haley stuff. Um, always want his takes. I also have Kim's news waiting. You know, Kim's got news on that. Kim, how are you? And a lot of other stuff that's going on in the world. You can see how I would be in a bit of a quandary. Quandary would be in a ding kind of way. What should I do, I ask you? Producer Albert. Albert, thank you. A uh, quick stinger. We'll get right to Rothman, then we'll have a supersized news at the top of the hour. Love it. Let's do it. The Mark Thompson Show. Did I just get? Uh, what? What is it, Ken? Did what I just it? get? I just got bumped for Rothman. That's what happened to me. Just right I... now. 
at this moment. I, I got um, from well, there's never been anything like this. Well, I think actually there is a lot like this uh, typically. Yeah, that, I, that's not fake. That's real. <laughs> you know, she, she's right. She uh, was. Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you. you've got to be in this world. You've got to be nimble. Yeah. Flexible. And I think you are those things. Mm. And so. Um, Dianora, yeah. sucker. <laughs> How about it for John Rothman, everybody? John Rothman, welcome. Well, you and know, I want you to note, I am not wearing my headphones either. Geez, because my really computer is set up this way. I, this is this is outrageous. It really it just is. goes. To, if you'll pardon a bad pun, you can do it. Ah, uh, there you go. I I got it. I got it because these are called cans. The original, yeah. I don't know why, because we have so many sounds and different elements here. We were outfitted with this originally, and but maybe it has uh, outlived its usefulness. Um, it's a radio thing too. You know, we came from the radio, and so maybe it was a, a holdover uh, from that. Would, would you feel better if I put my cans on? I can't possibly feel better than I already feel, John, so don't worry about it. I am so excited to talk to you on the on the day after the New Hampshire primary where Donald Trump, predictably, I think on some level, uh, was dominant. How dominant was he, and is there a way to handicap Nikki Haley's future based on the results? There's never been anything like it, if I can quote <laughs> Donald Trump. There's never been anything like this. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, you He's cannot... not wrong. If he, if he gets a nomination early, I mean, like this, if he becomes the presumptive nominee, he's not wrong about there never being anything like it in, in recent memory, right? That is correct. Okay. Uh, anyway, clear. you go. Sorry. So uh, Donald Trump's victory is no surprise. It was a 10-point spread. Nikki Haley is going into her own state of South Carolina, and all the polls show her losing. Uh, all the key elected officials in the state of South Carolina have endorsed Trump. It's over. She may not know it's over, but I think the observation is correct. If something happens to Donald Trump, and this is a real question between now, who would be eligible to receive delegate votes? And the reason the campaigns are suspended and not ended is because you can still compete. But my fantasy is that there is an open convention. That is to say that if Donald Trump were not around for any number of reasons, legal, medical, whatever the case may be, you would then have an open convention, and that would really be incredible. But the reality is it's over. Donald Trump will be the nominee of the Republican Party, and that's the reality. And Nikki Haley will be a footnote to history. Wow. I mean, well, people are saying how embarrassing for Nikki Haley. Nikki got a lot of independent voters. Was there in the ashes of the whole thing some way that you can discern how voters might lean in a general election, Trump and Biden? Oh, Biden is going to win. It's very clear because all you have to do is take a look at the number of people in the CNN polls and the Fox polls, all the polls, who say they won't vote for Trump under any circumstances. So I don't see a path to victory for Trump. The real challenge will be uh, if Trump is nominated uh, and loses the election or wins, what will the Republican Party do? They'll be out from underneath Donald Trump. If he wins, he's a lame duck, and lame ducks generally have a very tough time. And uh, the second aspect is if he loses, the Republican Party will no longer have Donald Trump to deal with, at least not as a potential candidate. Although, as somebody pointed out to me, he could run in 2028 again. <laughs> so, I mean, only if he loses, by the way. You, you can't have a third term. So, it's very interesting. It's a real challenge for the Republican Party. It's a tragedy. It's an American tragedy. And it will be written about that way in years ahead. It's an American tragedy because it reflects a, a broken electorate, a broken populace? No, a broken Republican Party. Okay. I don't think the American electorate is broken. I think Well, most they're the Americans ones they're the ones are... supporting it. I mean, why? why uh, but you're saying it, 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 it rots from the head type thing. Well, sure. It's, it's Republican voters. Why does Trump have a clear path to the nomination? Let's assume for a minute that Nikki Haley wins in South Carolina. Uh, it's not going to happen, but let's assume she did. What's her path to nomination? Take a look at the states. The states are solid Trump states. They're not Nikki Haley states. You can't campaign for Super Tuesday in a broad general sense. It's not like Iowa or New Hampshire where you go in and you press the flesh, as we used to say. So I think that the tragedy for the Republican Party and for America 
is that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee for president. And by the way, can you imagine Ronna Romney McDaniel, the national chair of the Republican Party, basically saying to Nikki Haley, it's over. Donald Trump is our nominee. Let's unify it. It's, it's, it's very disturbing all the way around, particularly for me. I'm teaching a class on the making of the president 2024. When I go into class next, uh, next week, uh, what am I going to say to people? It's over. No, there'll be a lot to talk about, but, uh, uh, well, I mean, I think one thing you can talk about, I mean, I know you, you don't lack of, uh, for things to talk about, but, uh, you know, I think it was pointed out here in the chat, two things were pointed out. I want to double back and, uh, follow up on one was that she kind of blew it it was suggested by not going after him more aggressively in the early going and sort of waiting and by the time this is the uh, a criticism as you know of ron DeSantis as well that he was so busy kissing butt or or avoiding trump in in any sort of insulting fashion or speaking of him in any sort of derisive way that he ended up uh, letting Trump grow too big to be taken down. They're Same. all afraid of Donald Trump. You right, antagonize right. the Trump base. You cannot win the election. You so, cannot so unify the party. I get it. That's why they did it. So my question is then, is that if you had been their advisor, would you have said you got to go after him right away? We're getting in and you got to go after him right away. Well, look, I don't like Donald Trump. So I would say take off the gloves and do everything you can. But if you are a candidate for president of the United States in the Republican Party, you have to consider the fact that in order to run a competitive race for president, you can't alienate the base. I mean, it's just that simple. It's a conundrum that um, that we face in dealing with practical politics. Now, but conundrums are doing word, but I, I, I'm not so sure, John. Then, if by by extension, then, but your logic, why are you running at all? I mean, you're going to alienate the base by running. No. Why do you know? Why do you think they're running? It's ego. Oh, they okay. all want to be president of the United States. And and that's a very simple fact. Now, and you, you know, you've got to play the game, though. I mean, it, you know, you, they you, are. I mean, They're playing know. the game. If Donald Trump stumbled and went out, they could always say, oh, we never attacked Donald Trump. Uh, the base will still come along with me. Uh, what was Ron DeSantis running as? He was running as a Trump light, if you will. Well, he's running as, yeah, he's running as the the new, you know, he kept saying Trump's lost something off his fastball. Same thing was happening with Garvey the other night. He wasn't wanting to insult but Trump. How about this from Randy? Biden only won four or five swing states in 2020 by 50,000 or so votes. Biden winning is not a done deal. John Rothman. Okay. Think about the number of people who under no circumstances will vote for Donald Trump. Take a look at all the polls. And I can tell you that anyone who runs against Donald Trump, it's not voting for, it's voting against. There are more people who will vote against Donald Trump than, than you can imagine. And in order to carry swing states, you've got to carry those people. Could something change? Of course it could. But remember, we have a man who's been indicted in 91 different cases, four different uh, cons uh, areas of, of uh, indictment, uh, and a man who, uh, frankly, I, 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 I don't see his path to victory. And I think the Republicans understand it. Why do you think Republicans in the Senate hung back for so long? They don't have a choice now. Although, I hasten to point out, Mitch McConnell has not made a comment. By the way, there's another point. Who will Donald Trump select as his vice presidential nominee? Well, let me point out Ron DeSantis cannot be the nominee because he is from Florida and so is Donald Trump. Remember the president of, uh, of uh, Dick Cheney who was registered to vote in Texas, had to shift to Wyoming in order to be the vice presidential nominee. And those of you who were listening in KGO in those days, why was I one of the first to point out that Dick Cheney would be the nominee? Because I pointed out his switch in voter registration. Uh, what about uh, having someone uh, like uh, Governor Haley? Well, Trump doesn't want her. He's got a host of people he can take, including Elise Stefanik, who is my number one on the list of potential vice presidential candidates. Number sure. three Republican in the House of Representatives, a woman, she replaced uh, uh, Liz Cheney. Uh, she has great gravitas. Uh, it's a perfect match in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. Trump is still talking about Carrie Lake. Uh, there are a variety of women who he could put on the on the ticket. And of course, Tim Scott. Tim Scott can no longer be accused of being gay. He's getting married. He's engaged. And that may put him center stage. But he I, is getting married to Donald Trump, 
Right. Well, yeah. Just, yes. uh, just uh, I, 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 I love mean, that. Yeah, you deserve it, that's his first that. love, isn't it? Yes, I thought that. You know, no and one. And he loved... said that. He said that in his comment. You uh, must hate Nikki Haley. And uh, the response was, "No, I love Donald Trump." Uh, maybe Albert can find that and play it. Maybe his, so, um, maybe his vow to his wife will be something along the lines of, "Donald is my first love, but." You are a close second, darling. Uh, the Not question, a great way to begin a marriage. The question as to Donald Trump's mental acuity. He seems to be slipping. Oh, excuse confused, me. What did you say your name was again? Confused his Republican it, primary opponent, Nikki Haley, with former who, who House who Speaker Nancy you? Pelosi. Who are you? He claimed Haley was in charge of security during the January 6th attack on the Capitol, that she refused all of his offers of help. Um, Haley, of course, the, you know, she was his own UN ambassador. She wasn't in office and she wasn't even in Washington on January 6th. Um, apparently at his rally this past Saturday night in Manchester, he didn't address the Haley Pelosi mix up, but assured his supporters that he took a cognitive test and he quote, I aced it. He previously boasted of his ability to identify an image of a whale on an assessment I mean, again, I don't know, you know, it's he's, a whale of a tail. <laughs> there you go. So, uh, but as you put, as you stack these things uh, together, um, you can do it with Biden as well, but Biden's, uh, Biden slips. And if you want to look at his impairment, as far as speaking is concerned, it dates back to the fact that he was a stutterer. And I don't mean to make excuses for an older man, you can lose it. And I think both these guys have lost a step. But Donald Trump, it suggested, has really kind of stepped off the curb. He's um, he's unable to really distinguish uh, world leaders. You know, the Turkish leader from the Hungarian leader, Nikki no, Haley he, from he, Nancy he, he Pelosi. Remembers, he remembers uh, Hungary's leader. He quotes him. He says, that's the kind of leader he wants to be. But Mark, I didn't mean to interrupt you before, and I apologize for that, but I couldn't figure out whether I was on the Ron Owen show, the Gil Gross show. Uh, who are you? you know, right. So if you're saying, if you get to that point, you're, you're, yeah, you're yeah. in big trouble. And right. But let me explain. And I said it before, and I know I got a lot of criticism for it. Uh, Donald Trump's people are, are in a cult. They will not admit to any failure. But the simple truth is that the uh, Donald Trump is not the same person that he was 10 years ago. But then again, I've known Joe Biden through the years. He isn't the same as he was either. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm sure that there are those watching going, come on, you guys are doing the same thing. You're making excuses for your guy because you're in the cult of whatever, of Joe Biden or of uh, the Democrats or the anti-Trump cult. No, whatever they call it, it applies you know. both sides. It's, yeah. it's very clear. And cognitive awareness when you're president of the United States is critical. You can I make slip-ups. Yeah. You and I have made slip-ups. Uh, and you make slip-ups, but Donald Trump can't even admit he made a slip-up, and that's a problem too. The um, the fact is he's he's covered by journalists the same way they covered him in uh, in you know in the 2016 election, John. I don't think there's been any kind of profound evolution uh, from a media standpoint of the way Donald Trump has been covered. Um, you know the document case which has sort of been parked, to me is still the biggest sort of slam dunk from a Q&A standpoint. Why, sir, did you take so many documents that you were filling a bathroom at Mar-a-Lago, a ballroom at Mar-a-Lago, your office, a bedroom, a closet, et cetera, you're waving them around? I mean, aren't, shouldn't we be troubled by that? Mark, I'd at least like to see that question. Ask him about his Supreme Court appointments. Mark, it's very clear you don't like Donald Trump. I understand that. <laughs> and that's why I discount everything you say. Uh, do you understand that's what it's going to come down to? I see. Facts aren't going to matter. Don't confuse people with the facts is something I've said many times. The people who support Donald Trump will support him no matter what. What's tragic, and let's put Trump aside, is the Republican Party. I've been in the Republican Party over the years and seen great fights, fights that benefited the country, as we've seen in the Democratic Party. Great fights. We don't see any fights in the Republican Party. It, they're marching in lockstep. And even members of the United States Senate and the House of Representatives who were critical of Donald Trump are now excusing what happened on January 6th. 
They're all important issues. They are all critical issues. But it seems not to matter to people who are committed to voting for Donald Trump. Question is, if something happens to Donald Trump between now and the convention, what happens then? How will the party choose its candidate? And the only thing I can think of is there would be an open convention. And we haven't had an open convention since 1952 when Adlai Stevenson was nominated by the Democrats. You know, something happened. This is apart from the, I think you've made, you know, your points well uh, on this issue of the presidential election. Something happened at the end of last year. There were bills introduced to Congress to uh, essentially prevent the Medicare pay cut from going into effect. It's a 3.3% pay cut. And then I think there's a 2.5% pay cut on top of that. This is when I say pay cut. This is the cut that would go to doctors for treating that people with correct. Medicare coverage. Uh, Congress adjourned before even taking up that bill that would have prevented th those Medicare cuts from going into effect. Could you comment on that? Listen, talk about a do-nothing Republican Congress, to quote Harry Truman. He talked about the good-for-nothing 80th Congress. We can talk about the good-for-nothing Congress that exists now. Uh, the Republicans are paralyzed. They have not produced anything for their voters. And I would point out to you, Speaker Johnson hangs by a thread. Uh, he's got a revolt on the right uh, in the Freedom Caucus. So what, what can I tell you? The Congress is completely unproductive. And if I were Joe Biden, if I were managing Joe Biden's campaign, I would talk about that good-for-nothing Republican Congress, and I'd explain their problems. But let me point out to you, even people like Congresswoman Chase, even people like uh, Elise Stefanik, people who have at various times been somewhat critical of Trump, they're all in line. And that's what's scary to me. That's the real issue. And, I think and we're, John, would you, I think we're per, so personality driven, you know, uh, Trump, Biden, uh, it's all personality. It's, it feels like a high school presidential, you know, student body. That's election, the way presidential as opposed campaigns, to, that's the way yeah, presidential and, campaigns are run. And that's why uh, this is a broken system. And that's why you need journalism. But even journalists, you need journalists to bring up this Medicare thing. You need the, you need these policies that are, that are really relevant to people's lives. You need Medicare, that up. the Supreme court, the immigration issue. I can go down the list of all of the issues that should be discussed. I, yesterday in my podcast, I went through a whole series of foreign policy issues which are being completely ignored by the press. And that's why I, I really feel it's a tragic moment for us in more ways than one. But again, I would only remind you, who is president of the United States matters. A president is the decisive factor on all of these issues. And by the way, it would help if you had a functional Congress we clearly don't have a functional Congress, and I think that's the reason why the Democrats will probably take control of the House and the Senate. Although the numbers may not reflect it, I think there is such outrage. Look, look, look at the question of reproductive rights for women. We just had the anniversary of, of Roe v. Wade, 51 years. I think there's going to be a backlash come November that will stun the Republicans. Uh, and I, people say to me, certainly well, there was in the midterm. Yeah, and obviously. there will be again. No. This is such a critical issue. And by the way, did you hear the president and the vice president speaking about this yesterday in their first real joint appearance together? It was powerful. And if you're watching the ads that are being produced on the question of a woman's reproductive rights, uh, it's, it's remarkably powerful. So will all of that resonate? Will it make a difference? And that goes back to what happened in New Hampshire. Uh, the diehard Trump people put Trump across the line. But Trump was wrong. He said he always carries New Hampshire. He didn't carry New Hampshire in the last election. And I'm going to point out to you, that is going to be the reaction universally. Because what we know is, Richard Nixon once told me, you want to win a Republican primary, you run to the right. You want to win a Democratic primary, you run to the left. You want to win the election, the person who gets to the center first wins. And Donald Trump is incapable, in my mind, of getting to the center and certainly his record is such that I don't think uh, I don't think it'll work. One other quick point, the Supreme Court is going to be a major issue in this campaign. I've been saying this now for some weeks, but they have some critical decisions to make. And one of the most important will be the question of uh, Donald Trump's claim last week of immunity on all questions when he was president of the United States. 
I don't believe the Supreme Court can affirm immunity, but if they did, I can assure you that would be a campaign issue. And if they don't, it'll be a campaign issue as well. So there's a lot riding on what happens in November, and that's the reason why, and uh, we were talking about this earlier, uh, Kim and I, on the question of uh, progressives who say they will not vote for Biden. Uh, I have to tell you, I believe honestly, when you have two major candidates on the ballot, Biden or Trump, those progressives are going to turn out. They would dread a Trump presidency. Well, we they, didn't, I mean, they didn't turn out in 2016 for him, John. They didn't. No, I but mean, this you... is not 2016. Okay. Roe v. Wade has been rescinded. Uh, look at what's happening. I mean, there's so many issues that have happened. Okay. So you're saying wanting. the progressives, that that is the, the further left um, or farther left, part, whatever it's further or farther uh, out there on the left, they're going to be essentially shocked by what they have uh, back in to getting to the ballot box and holding their nose and voting for Biden. Exactly. And that's, we can talk about third parties at another time. And I know we will as things move forward. Uh, the danger of a third party is not that they win an election. The last third party to win a presidential election was the Republican Party in 1860 with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the danger is they become spoilers, as we saw in Florida in the sure. year 2000, where uh, both the Pat Buchanan vote and the vote for Nader uh, prevented Gore from carrying that state. Well, and of course, the, the, the Supreme Court is what prevented Gore. Gore won that election, and in, I think, six or seven different independent investigations and counts and all these different ways that they counted with the Chads, without the Chads, et cetera, uh, Gore won it, but Gore conceded, and the Supreme Court said, stop counting. We know that story. We can talk about it another but time. I'm out, the Supreme Court was an issue then. It will be an issue now. Yes, sir. I and mean, it's so, uh, and sadly, because uh, to, to note something else you just said a couple of minutes ago, because Congress is a do nothing place right now, uh, and Congress can only get so much through, it goes to the courts, and you have even more power conferred to the Supreme Court than there would be otherwise. And that's it's, why this question of immunity, you were talking about the, the case of the, all the confidential classified documents Trump took. The real question for me is how far does presidential immunity extend? If Trump does not have immunity, if he can't gain that, he's in big trouble. And he knows it. I love our time together, but sadly it has come to an end. You can find John on the John Rothman podcast, it's called Around the Political World with John Rothman. You can also find him all across the KGO hosts who used to be on KGO. John pops in regularly on Nikki's show and here. So, but can we I love you. Say, you have big news uh, about the number of people subscribing. I do want you to know I had big news this morning. We now have 140,000 downloads on wow. Around the Political World with John Rothman. Wow. I, want to say it, I want to say it one more time. Mm. You must support what Mark Thompson is doing. I don't charge for my podcast at this point, but in order to sustain the wonderful work that Mark does, uh, that Nikki does, uh, you have to subscribe. You have to support it. Well, and, subscribing uh, is is free uh, here on YouTube, uh, and wherever you are, giving us a thumbs up is free. But yeah, we are we we support um, people here. You know, Kim and Albert and Tony and myself. You know, there is, there are salaries. And I'm willing to waive my exorbitant salary. <laughs> I was willing to double your. I was going to double your exorbitant yeah, salary. Right. So there you go. Well, may I say it's always a pleasure, and I want to thank Albert, and I want to uh, thank Kim McAllister, and Kim. I apologize for bumping you from the news in my yeah. book. You are always at the top of every list. Oh, wow. You can bump me anytime, baby. Man, I'll tell you what. This thing's getting too hot. I don't know what... Uh... what wasn't the, weren't we just talking about in the heat of the night? Ch yeah. yeah. My bad. I'm sorry. John Rothman, everybody. Thank you, John. Hi, guys. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye now. The Mark Thompson Show. John Rothman. What a guy. Teacher. Yeah. Lecture. Does it all, huh, Albert? Hey, Albert. Uh... He I don't mentioned have me more... first too, so I love that. He what? He he did mention me first when he was he thinking. Did. No, you're right. So, um, I don't have any more guests. Right? Rothman yeah. was the last one. That's it. Because one thing this show has lacked, in my view, is um, honestly a lot of me. Yeah, I think that you know, there's I I have Do thought. You know, which one is Mark Thompson? Kind of a big deal. Yeah, I I'm. I've got views, okay? I have takes. I've got fresh, clean takes. You know what I mean, Albert, when I say that? 
Hey, Albert, have you seen the sh- new short that's up that skewers you for having not put the podcast up? No, I've yet to see that. I don't think I'll, um, I-, I can't find it. <laughs> Speaking of skewers, I do have something to share with the class. All right. I was um, going through papers last night trying to clear out the clutter. And I found this this beautiful holiday card sent to me by the Mark Thompson household. I ah. opened it up and there's a big message on it. And it says, happy holidays, Kim. Thank you for um, the... <laughs> Legibility issue. Someone did this to spoil issue. our Christmas. Yeah, right. Yeah. Thank you for something, something throughout the year. <laughs> An important part of the Mark Thompson show, and I am grateful for all the time spent with you on and off. I look forward to next year with love, Courtney. I was going to say that doesn't sound like me. And then you get to the the very few words on the bottom. A second message. Mm. Kim, you're great. We'll miss you, Mark. (laughs) (laughs) I was just saying, like, I want it to be noted. That's that's all you could write to me as a holiday message. Kim, you're great. We'll miss you, Mark. I th- oh, uh, you did also draw a happy face. So I did. I, you know that it that. took me a while. That was actually uh, multiple drafts on that happy face. The first couple to, were not happy enough. I'm saving so this I, card because of that. There yeah. Well, yeah. as you should. I mean, it's, it's for, it. Yeah. The message it's an artifact of this show. I don't think it landed apparently with the kind of uh, warmth that uh, Kim, how are you? you wanted, but uh, it was nonetheless, uh, it is something special. How about a quick shout out? And then I want to get to the news and I do have a lot. I've got a lawn disorder. That's rich and bowling with Biden all in the next hour. And you know, we'll get it all in. I promise you. Joy Branson, how Big shout about out. a quick $10 super chat? All my faves together today. She says, yeah. love that. Thank you, Joy. Thank you for being part of this community. Gail Guthrie, HOF. Big shout out. This is for your new computer purchase. How about a 20? Yeah, I have to do. Gosh, I got to I got to get this thing. There's a couple of rerouting, I feel like. I'm sure if you yeah. tell Tony, he'll just. I'll tell Tony. He'll yeah. he'll get it done. Thanks, Tony. Yeah. Uh, and blessing with a 20 super sticker. Big shout out. Big Ann. shout out. Oh, well, you guys are so cool. You stepped wow. up in our in our hour of need. Stan Pollock, CPA, my favorite CPA. Good morning, Stan. When I'm doing my cpa I want to do it with Stan Pollock. CPA. $10. Big How about shout it? Out. Thank you, Stan. Appreciate that. Um, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to cry. I'm close. I'm close. There's been a lot of love here today. We're only an hour in. A lot of love. I'm not going to cry. That's all I'm, I'm saying. A lot of love. A lot of love. Kim's news, smash the like button if you would. With your iron rod. Cost you nothing to hit the thumbs up button, and it uh, costs you nothing to subscribe to the show. Please share any part of the show, any of the videos. The short with Albert having screwed up, not posting the podcast. That's the latest short. Poor Albert. Yeah, yeah. But uh, we call it. You know, we call people out. We live out loud. Uh, Kim's news, and then as I say, bowling with Biden, lawn disorder, and that's rich. All follow in the next hour. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. Yep, and there he is. Uh, after winning by about a little more than 11% margin over the former UN ambassador, Nikki Haley, Donald Trump, instead of being overjoyed and happy and, you know, I won, woohoo, no. He issued a threat against Nikki Haley, his rival, saying that she would end up under investigation for stuff she doesn't want to talk about should she win the Republican primary. Wow. Well, what kind of opposition research do you have? If Tuesday's New Hampshire (laughs) primary is an indication, look for another Biden-Trump rematch come November. Former President Trump defeated uh, Nikki Haley 54 to 43 percent in Uh, the race yesterday. President Biden easily won the Democratic primary, but he did it as a write-in candidate because he didn't enter the race due to a dispute over the timing of the New Hampshire primary between the Democratic National Committee and New Hampshire Democrats. Still won anyway, so there you go. Ford is announcing a recall of nearly 2 million Explorer 
SUVs. So that's not good. The recall <laughs> is for explorers from the 2011 through the 2019 model years. The recall related to a piece of trim on the vehicle that could detach and become an airborne hazard for other drivers. What? So there have been reports of no reports of uh, accidents or injuries there. So check your Ford Explorer. The top Republican in the Senate is calling for more aid to Ukraine in its war with Russia. Senate minor Minority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, said today that he is uh, backing Ukraine is about cold, hard American interests. He said it is in America's interest to degrade Russia's military. And so that is what we must do. Uh, the restaurant industry is bouncing back after the pandemic. This is a good thing. We, we had uh, worried about what was going to happen with our restaurants. And it looks like, according to a recent report from Yelp, more than 53,000 restaurants opened last year in America. Wow. Yeah. That's a nice restaurant there that we have a picture of. It's no, no wonder that one's doing well. We're in better shape, but I don't think we're in wildly better shape. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't think that's from this story, but I love that drop. Thank you. Outdoor areas, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, according to a recent report from Yelp, more than 53,000 restaurants opened last year. That's an increase from 2022 and 2019. An official with Yelp says 2023 was the first time the industry saw more restaurant openings than pre-pandemic levels. The report also found there was an upswing in restaurant openings out west last year, and some of the fastest growing restaurant categories included creperies, pasta shops, and pop-up restaurants. I'm going to ding crepery, please, Albert. Yeah, thank you. I think crepery is a I mean, I'll go to a crepery. Where's a crepery? <laughs> Find me a crepe. What do they have that? Sometimes they have the I want a crepe, crepe immediately. Sometimes Stat. they have the Nutella banana crepe. Yeah, those are really good. Those are crepes. Yeah. Well, no uh, crepes over here. Some cities got heavy rain this morning around the Bay Area. Others, just a light sprinkling today. Forecasters warn there's a few small creeks here in the North Bay, Sonoma and Marin counties, that could overflow a bit. But they say major flooding is unlikely. As of yesterday, a creek in Livermore still had some rushing water. Crews rescued a woman sitting on top of her car after it flipped on Monday night, she sat there for nearly 15 hours until a camper in Del Val Regional Park saw her and call, called for help. Oh Fire God. officials are saying, yeah, this is why people should never attempt to drive through water, especially during or after a storm. Gotta it's the really biggest, careful. I believe, the biggest loss of life um, uh, associated with flooding. I've got to double check this. There's an immense loss of life with people trying to uh, cross standing water in their car. What do they have the um the slogan turn around don't drown? No. Yeah. yeah. You haven't heard that? No. Yeah. That's good. Give a hoot don't pollute. I could come up with a uh, bunch I of I see things. those are very good. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Click it or ticket, you know. Yeah, maybe we should drive high get a DUI. I like that. Thank wow. you. Thank really you. Guys. Yeah. Thank you. I love it. Security is high today over a school scare in Santa Clara County. Extra officers will be at all five Fremont Union High School District campuses this morning. The Sunnyvale Department of Public Safety said it was alerted yesterday about an email Monday threatening four high schools, Fremont, Homestead, Lynbrook, and Monte Vista. The agency said that threat is not believed to be credible, but still they're increasing police presence anyway out of an abundance of caution. Classes will go on as normal while police look into who sent that email. Oakland making changes in the wake of In-N-Out closing its only location in the city. That's what it took, In-N-Out to close. <laughs> People getting beaten, thrown to the ground. That's all right. But in and out closes, we got a problem. <laughs> Mayor Sheng Tao says she's adding more police patrols and technology in the Hagenberger corridor to deter and respond to criminal behavior. But she admits more needs to be done to protect what she calls a tourist gateway. I think the other day there was a story about uh, the gas stations, uh, the Oakland airport, the rental car agency saying, don't fill up at the gas stations along Hagenberger because the chances are good you'll get robbed, wow, attacked, whatever. Yeah, it's a horrible spot. 
the In-N-Out fast food chain claims this area has become so unsafe for customers and employees, they got to go. A Starbucks store in the same lot shut down last year and Raising Cane's, which is another restaurant in that area, has switched to drive through only to prevent car break-ins. You park the car and go into the restaurant, you come out and not good. This is disturbing. That Wow. It's really... What's happening? We're going the wrong direction. Listen, it's okay now because in and out closed. And so the attention is put on to the problem. See? Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes it takes a big uh, in and out closure to uh, to make it happen. In and out. We'll put the focus. That's what it's all about. Sure. San Jose is <laughs> keeping cars off one road for good. The city approved a permanent proposal to close down San Pedro Street to traffic. The shutdown started in 2020 because of the pandemic. This led to the Al Fresno program allowing businesses to use uh, I think it means al fresco, but whatever, uh, allowing businesses to use outside space in a safe legal way with restaurants expanding their seating. The plan is now repave the street into a sidewalk and reroute the parking garage exit to another street and San Pedro Street is car free. Lastly, a pet cat and good timing are being credited with saving a woman's life and salvaging much of a residence after a mobile home fire in Fresno. This happened Tuesday. A Fresno fire spokesperson says a pet cat nudged a woman awake after she left a stovetop burner on, which started a fire. A fire engine on a training exercise happened to be in that area when the fire was reported and responded within a minute of the call. The woman safely escaped the fire and suffered only minor smoke uh, inhalation, according to the fire department. Thank goodness for her cat. You never, you hear about a dog's coming to the rescue, but not usually a cat. I uh, I adore the felines, as you know, and mm. I'm glad that you've included a positive feline story. Just for you, Mark Thompson. Thank you. I'm feeling that. generous today, despite the lack of love in the Christmas note. This report, <laughs> <laughs> this report sponsored by Coachella Valley Coffee.com. Woohoo! Oh, I'm having the hibiscus tea today. And it, it's really, really good. They have a ginger mint tea that is crazy good. Mm. Moroccan mint is amazing. So is the um, the Earl Grey is good. So good. So, and you like the coffee too. This I love the a, coffee. Been had drinking it all morning. This is one of those ways you can pamper yourself, right? It's not cheap, but if you take the Mark Thompson Show discount, suddenly. All is right with the world. Well, I'll tell you that you mentioned not cheap. The reason you can find so many beans on the internet that are uh, cheap cheap is mm -hmm. because you're not getting fresh grow. This is the yes. first cut, okay? Fresh grow. So these beans are very carefully sourced, as you know, sustainably sourced. And Coachella Valley Coffee does so much work giving money. Mm -hmm. to businesses in Central and South America and also in Africa with their, their women-run businesses, typically, because they find that women use the money responsibly. And oh, then they become, you know? they, they build a relationship with that uh, grower. So that's well, why it's ladies. really terrific. Yeah, and it's really, really good. So CoachellaValleyCoffee.com is the website. Click around on there. And then if you do end up with something in your cart, make sure that you put this code in, Mark T. No spaces in between. All together, Mark T, you get an exclusive 10% discount just for listening to The Mark Thompson Show. You so do. You enjoy do. the good stuff and treat yourself because it is stuff. worth it. Treat I'm yourself. That's right. Are you making mm. fun of me? Yeah. Yes, I'm making right. fun of you. What, you know? All right. I'm Kim McAllister. Maybe you should read that Christmas card. Gonna Thank you, uh, Kim. Nice Very job. Jack nice job. Mark Thompson Show. Mark Thompson Show. <laughs> The Mark Thompson Show. Who's Mark Thompson? Feels great, baby. Let me kick down the door and talk to my cheap sons and daughters. No context will suffice to explain the hurt and anguish caused by my words. I apologize to all who have been hurt. stand corrected. I misspoke.
My words upset so many people. And I wanted to apologize to the Asian community, the Asian American community. God bless America. The end. There's never been anything like this. Do I hit it long? Is Trump strong? Huh? Who is having that conversation? It's fantastic. That's not fake. That's real. The science is ridiculous. How would you handle this? We could try ignoring it, sir. If you get it in order, you get extra points. Listen to me. I don't want to hear you. You cannot say you love your country. Where are my weed smokers at? This is a word from the Lord, and he's not happy. There is no defense for my conduct. It was wrong, it was stupid, and I'm trying to be a better person. Don't ever use that word. You get nothing! What's a guilty pleasure to do about? Seriously, what the f***? What up, everybody? I was just uh, noting an email I got from the magical Trevor in Concord, California. Now he's Trevor Star in Hollywood, California. And uh, very cool to see a um, limited edition Mark Coffee. That's right. From S. Jones. Can I please order an order, an order of Mark T.? There you go. Yeah, right there on the website, as you know. It's CoachellaValleyCoffee.com. Anyway, I was looking at the – so grateful for the sponsors, you know, as we close, and I have to just say as an aside, you know, it's really hard. We're trying to make ends meet. We try to stay on the air, try to give you fresh content. Even, you know, when I'm away, I'll try to record something. I'll always give you fresh content. I was noting, and I'm not going to mention any names, but there's a major YouTuber – who does a daily show like this one, and it's political. And I have mad respect for this person. But when this person's away, they just do a rerun. They don't even have anybody. So mm -hmm. we try to give you some fresh content uh, on this. I felt kind of proud that we at least had tried to show that commitment, that level of commitment. Anyway, I uh, digress. Thank I'm so grateful for the sponsors and all the support. Now, um, Trevor is a regular listener from the very beginning, the KGO days, as so many of you have been. And he is one of the people who hears a drop and he'll send it to us. Uh, he, the drop that he likes uh, personally is the pure speculation. That's pure speculation. The pure speculation drop is his. And he'll always sign his notes to me with that's pure speculation that's pure speculation yeah so mark here are a couple of drops from your new pal george santos remember um oh yeah i got the uh cameo from george santos for my birthday which was just last month and some of the drops the first is kim being impatient as usual then mm -hmm. it seems she was showing a bit of support for the for trump what on nikki on nikki's show no uh, then she said she doesn't not doesn't want it to be used as a clip, so naturally I had to grab it. <laughs> Personally, I think her saying she doesn't want something uh, to be used as a drop is a great drop, he says. Yeah, yeah. But that is pure speculation. That's pure speculation. And glad to hear speculation again. I hope it doesn't fade away, he says. Uh, so I'll play a few for you. Um, one is uh, one that I... I remember you. This is uh, from Kim. I blame you. Yeah. I blame you. <laughs> that might be a good draw. I blame you. Mm. Mm. I don't know. Don't make fun of me. Don't make fun of me. I don't like how squeaky you got on that. So yeah. I'm gonna, I yeah, say it's that's very a Mickey no. Mouse. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a little, um, <laughs> doesn't quite work. How about the George Santos stuff? Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. I love that one. Oh, that's yeah. great. <laughs> that is just great. Come on. Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. I mean, Albert, that has to be on one of our sweepers. Uh, I'll, we'll try to mix that together. Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. Yeah. And a lot of people are telling me you're a liar. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are telling me you're a liar. Yeah. 
That's pretty great. I mean, those two together. Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. And a lot of people are telling me you're a liar. Yeah. Uh, so that's pretty fun. Um, I think he says, what's a little lie between friends? Let me see if I can find that. Um, oh, what's the worst? Good, the what's wor- the worst that could happen? I like that, too. What's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? Maybe not as much as the other ones, but I do like it. Um, and I think that's it. A little lie between friends. What's a little lie between friends? I like that. Um, let's see if I can get that to. Here we go. What's a little lie between friends? <laughs> What's a little lie between friends? I like. Uh, hi, Mark. George Santos here. I think is really funny. Yeah. A lot of people are telling me you're. I mean, that's a lot of people are telling me you're a liar. And uh, what's a little lie between friends? What's a little lie between friends? I think yeah. that's kind of fun. So, I want to thank Trevor Star who's now in Hollywood, gave up his life in the Bay Area to move to Southern California, I think with his daughter who's going to school there. And uh, those are really cool drops. So thank you very much. I blame you. Yeah, really, really uh, good stuff. Thank you, Trevor, for that. The Mark Thompson Show. If you have anything to send us, you can send uh, uh, to the email address, which is uh, themarkthompsonshow at gmail.com. Themarkthompsonshow at gmail.com. And so... I, I, I look, I've received a lot of positive letters. I look forward to always getting a note. And by the way, I got a note that there's a new Patreon member, Linda, Hello. everybody. Thank you, Linda, hey, for Linda. joining us. Big shout out to you, Linda, and all of our Patreon subscribers. Big shout out. Um, and PayPal, many on PayPal as well. As I say, we're going to um, do some special events coming up, and I think uh, we'll have a chance to acknowledge even more formally. But at the end of the show, we always acknowledge Every single person who is on PayPal or on Patreon, you are the guys who make the engine run every day. The Mark Thompson Show at gmail.com is our address. So that's how you reach us on email. Now, The Mark Thompson Show. Albert, what would you like to do? Bowling with Biden first? I've got bowling with Biden, that's rich, and law and disorder. You're the producer. What's easy for you? I don't want to stress you too much. What's easiest to run first? Uh, I'm just going to go with bowling with Biden since... uh, Great. Bowling with Biden. I love it. This is Bowling with Biden. Live from White House Lanes... It's bowling with Biden. It's go time. This man's going to win a lot of political offices. Now, here's your bowling with Biden host, Mark Thompson. Well, thank you, everybody. Biden won the New Hampshire primary without being on the ballot. How you there like was them a apples? Big effort among those supporters of Biden to encourage New Hampshire voters to write in Joe Biden's name on the ballot. So, in that way, I mean, you may say, you know, because you're not hear a lot about it, you're like, who did he beat? I mean, well, you say he won. Like, well, Congressman Dean Phillips from Minnesota and also Marianne Williamson was on the ballot in New Hampshire. Okay. And uh, those are just, you know, two that you might be familiar with. There were also uh, 19 other candidates on the ballot in New Hampshire going against Biden who wasn't even on the ballot there. Um, because it's, it's easy in New Hampshire to get on the ballot. It's easier to qualify. You know how in California it's easy to qualify to be on the gubernatorial ballot? Mm-hmm. Uh, similarly in New Hampshire, it's easy to get into the, uh, primary voting. Now, why wasn't Biden there? Just to remind you that why wasn't Biden on the ballot there? Because the Democrats have stated that they want to start their primaries in South Carolina. They feel at least that this was articulated that that's a more representative state when it comes to the cross section of America. You know, you can have that conversation all day, but in any case, um, Biden didn't campaign in New Hampshire. He, uh, you know, didn't appear on the ballot. But again, they uh, and, and uh, they you know, changed the date of the Democratic presidential primary, New Hampshire, et cetera, and it was a way, sort of, the Democratic National Committee of biting back on New Hampshire. Anyway, that was the deal on Joe Biden. He uh, wins despite not being on the New Hampshire ballot. But that's not the only Biden who's in bowling with Biden. Yes, what? I am going to visit. Hunter Biden now. Hunter Biden, the painter. Did you know that Hunter Biden is an artist? Of course you did. There was some 
buzz about this when these paintings first came out. Well, just to be fair, because let's be fair, got to say, I'm not evaluating his art, but if you look at who's buying the art, it does look like they're maybe currying favor by buying Hunter Biden's art. He has sold a total of $1.5 million worth of art. Maybe the it's gal- just that good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Come on, Mark. Why can't maybe he's really good? Yeah. Have you well, seen it? George Berges, an art gallery owner who is a small dollar donor to Trump anybody? Donor. Yeah. Biden, you'd say? Yeah. You'd be wrong. What? Trump. Oh. It's Trump. What? That's right. That. The owner of the gallery is a Trump guy. See, uh-huh. this story is multi layered. Yeah. So listen closely. George Burgess, an art gallery owner who gave small dollar donations about 20 times he did to Donald Trump in 2020, he signed an agreement shortly after that year's election to take on an unusual task to represent Hunter Biden, the son of president-elect at that time, Joe Biden. There's never been anything like this. The agreement produced arrangements that drew concern from ethics experts and now has brought increasing scrutiny Scrutiny is a ding word from House Republicans. The transcript from the House panel's closed-door interview with Bear Gase, who is the gallery owner, I'll remind you, released this week, provides the most complete picture to date of Hunter Biden's artwork, including when his paintings have been sold and for how much. In total, there have been 10 buyers of the art. They paid a sum of $1.5 million. The gallerist... That's a ding word. Got 40% of the sale. That's wow. a lot. It's a good business just to be the middleman. Biden took 60%. Three of the buyers have been identified. The other seven remain anonymous. The largest share of the work, 11 paintings for a total of $875,000, went to Kevin Morris, who's become one of Biden's closest friends, while also acting as an attorney and financial benefactor. Morris said, I really like Hunter's art. And, you know, of course, he gets pilloried for it. And, you know, all kinds of things said to him. The art, in my view, as an art collector, is very good. Hmm. So, you know, there are two other pieces of Biden's uh, art, Hunter's art, one for 52000 another for 42000 That was, uh, those were purchased by Democratic donor Elizabeth Naftali and Naftali was appointed in her in 2022 to the U.S. Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad. So all I'm saying is, as we look into Hunter Biden's art, it does seem to, in large measure, go to Democratic donors. Maybe they like his art. Maybe they're currying favor with his dad. But those are the realities. Albert, can you Google any of Hunter Biden's art quickly and see if we... I was just doing it. Yeah. It, it's actually, it's kind of like a, a bit modern, you could say. I have some picture, pieces to show you. Okay. So we can. Yeah. Yeah. I looked at Hunter Biden's paintings online and I like them, says Lori Gross. Well, there you go. That's not bad. Yeah. I don't think it's bad at all. Here's another That's really one. not. That's, uh, uh, yeah, that looks, he. He's got pilloried as a ding word, says Tom. That's true. Pilloried as a ding word. Um, that's not bad at all, one. actually. A weird one, kind of. Well, that's kind of wild, yeah. That's yeah. wild. That's got some type know. of writing behind it. I mean, it's mm. not awful, you know. No, I mean, it, uh, it might be good. I mean, it really is. Uh, I, when it comes to art, I don't think you can judge it that way. I don't know what you'd pay for it, but again, I'm not an art collector. I mean, I'm... I'm an inadvertent, unwilling art collector because Courtney's in the art world and she collects and sometimes I have to, you know, step up and collect and pretend I'm interested in it. Uh, Yeah, like I don't like that particularly. No, it looks like spiders. Yeah, but I mean, I can see where it would appeal. Um, To an art dealer, says John Watson, a piece of art is, quote, good if its value increases. 
Yeah, it's pretty cool, says Sandy. Yeah, I think you could argue that it, it's not bad. No. That was good, knowledge. says Mark. Yeah, yeah, last one. Okay. Um, My uncle taught painting, says Michael. Dude seems to have a sense of form and color. Yeah, so again, I don't want to dump on the guy. Yeah, that's kind of a cool piece, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, let's face it. It can be a cool piece and a good piece of art, but it may not command that kind of money were it not from Hunter Biden and were his dad not Joe Biden. <laughs> so that's all I'm saying. But with that, you know, you've seen it. Now you know who's buying it, and that is your Bowling with Biden. That's all for this edition. There's your new leader. But join us again next time for Bowling with Biden. The I didn't know this. I love the free Trump flag ad that YouTube puts before our show. Oh, no. They're nineteen ninety five at Walmart, says Brian. <laughs> wow. Well, uh, they picked the love hunter says not. Maud. Yeah, I don't know. Um, that might be a Google like sensing what you're searching. So be careful. I mean, that might be what you're searching. Those commercials. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Mark, I just received a DM from Hunter who thanks you for marketing his artistic endeavors. Yeah. <laughs> Beauty's in the eye of the beholder, says Julie. Yeah. Well, all of those things are true. So that's the word on uh, Hunter Biden. Yeah, I, we don't have control over the ads, but it is kind of interesting to hear what ads run you know uh albert i don't know if you saw this uh, well I'll, I'll i'll put that into that's rich it's a pretty big uh financial deal and that's rich will follow i have um a law and disorder that i'd like to quickly get to then kim's news and then that's rich does that sound like something we can work with yeah well, like okay that. so without any further delay let's do some law and disorder in the criminal justice system, the people pimps, addicts, thieves, bums, winos, girls who can't keep an address, and men who don't care are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. A cop, a flatfoot, a bull, a dick, John Law, you're the fuzz, the heat, your poison, your trouble, your bad news. These are their stories. Three Kansas City Chiefs fans were found frozen outside of the home of a friend who had, quote, no knowledge of their deaths. The homeowner in Missouri said his client, uh, the, the, the attorney representing, he, the, you'll understand why in a moment, the, you're not, he's now speaking through an attorney. Uh, the attorney representing the Missouri homeowner said his client had no idea that his friends were dying in the backyard after the Chiefs Chargers game. Essentially what happened is they went there to watch the game and the guy's ended up in the backyard, they couldn't get back in or they were unable to uh, gain access to the house and they froze to death out there. Uh, there is now an attorney involved and it looks to be a far more complicated situation. That's horrible. Yeah. I mean, it's not the Sunday that they planned on. Um, I don't know what will happen and no one's really giving a lot of details about this uh, story. Uh, it's not being investigated as a homicide, just so you know that. There have been no arrests or charges. No one's in custody. No specific threats or concerns as they investigate this. And uh, there's still a lot of social media buzz about this. The man was inside his home alive while friends were in the backyard for a long time and they were deceased. Um, and you're hearing, uh, from family members, my husband banged on his door for 20 minutes, oh, God. said, um, one of the associates of the men, um, the, I guess she's the, the wife, my friend, um, uh, for 20 minutes. And then she, my friend banged on his door and then busted a window and yelled and announced her presence while she's inside and still nothing from him. Then the cops come 10 minutes later. And he comes out nonchalant in his boxers with an empty wine glass in his hand. Nothing is adding up. Dave, Clay, and Ricky need and deserve justice. Again, the attorney says that his client, the owner of the home, had no knowledge that his friends were freezing to death on his property. Wow. He didn't even know that they were in his backyard until police knocked on the door. 
Uh, he's saying that the man was sleeping with headphones with a loud fan on when friends broke into the house. Didn't see messages until after the police arrived. I'd say stay tuned on this one, wouldn't you? Yeah. It's it weird. seems as, weird case. Yeah, truly, truly bizarre. Here's a case of a grifter getting nailed, but this grifter is a Colorado pastor. He's accused of pocketing $1.3 in crypto. Hey. Saying, saying the Lord told us to. This is a word mm. from the Lord, and he's not happy. A Colorado-based right. pastor for an online church accused of pocketing $1.3 through a cryptocurrency fraud scheme told his followers in a video statement, the Lord told me to do it. God works in mysterious ways. Eli Rigaldo and his wife marketed their cryptocurrency index, INDX coin, to Christian communities in Denver. He said God told him people would become wealthy if they invested. <sighs> index coin raised nearly $3.2 million. At least $1.3 million of that went directly into the Regalado's pockets okay. yeah. for their own <laughs> personal benefit. There he is. <clears throat> they could not be reached for comment. Uh, and uh, the couple also allegedly spent their investors' funds on, if you guessed, a Range Rover, oh. a luxu luxury handbags, jewelry, an au pair, boat rentals, snowmobile adventures. What a large... Yeah. It's great. Where you got all that money. Smokers at? Yeah. Hey, if yeah. God wants you to have these things. Who are you to say no? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, uh, I offer this sincere apology to you <laughs> yeah. today. He has not apologized yet. I apologize to all who have been hurt. No, he is My not. Bad. I apologize to every preacher and pastor. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The preachers and pastors are getting a bad name. I apologize to every preacher and pastor. All right. He claimed that God told him investors would become wealthy if they put money into index coin, promoting it as low risk, high profit. In reality, index coin was, quote, illiquid and practically worthless, according to the government. The cryptocurrency was available only in Kingdom Wealth Exchange with the, re with the uh, you might as well come as no surprise to you, the regalados shut that down. It can no longer be traded anywhere. So if you got index coin, you really are screwed. It was faith-based marketing. You know, he took advantage of people at his online only Victorious Grace Church. <laughs> he Not and his a lot wife of Grace going on there. He and his wife are listed <laughs> as the only two employees at that church. And uh a lot of people out a lot of money. People a have Chinese no shame. man no shame. Mm -mm. who chain smoked his way through a marathon was disqualified for <laughs> for smoking on the course. Of course, it's not allowed. What? Why? I mean, if you can run the course, I agree well. with you. Hey, man, you run it with a cigarette in your mouth, right? The 52-year-old Chinese <laughs> marathon runner was disqualified. There he is on YouTube. You can see him with the cigarette in his mouth. Disqualified for chain smoking during the race. Man, you got a bad Jones when you can't give it up while you're running There's a marathon. There's never been anything like this. The Chinese Athletics Association implemented a ban on smoking during marathons. It, it That ban went in last year. Uncle Chen, as he's called, has puffed cigarettes during past marathons, saying it helps him relieve fatigue. And... uh he finished that race in three hours and 28 minutes, five minutes faster than his most recent attempt. What? Imagine how unhealthy that is because you're breathing hard, right? Mm. And so the more you breathe, the deeper you uh, you inhale all that smoke. Oh. Yeah. It might be, Kim, offset, though, by all that exercise you're getting. You know no. what I mean? I'm just yeah. saying. I... You do not know oh. what you are talking about. Yeah, okay, it is possible that I don't know what I'm talking about. Imagine yeah. finishing after the guy, too. Like, you, not only did you finish after him, you finished <laughs> after a guy who was smoking cigarettes during the well, marathon. I can't run behind him because all that smoke's in my face. Uncle up there is smoking oh. like a chimney and finished ahead of you. No. Gosh, really, really rough. Well, there it is, the, uh, the magic of a Chinese marathon. They're cracking the whip. That's law and disorder for today.
Tune in again next time for more Law and Disorder on The Mark Thompson Show. All right, that's it. Let's roll. Hey, let's be careful out there. Yeah. I apologize to all who have been hurt. (laughs) All the preachers and pastors. I regret that your first impression of me is one of anger, hate, and resentment. Well, the 1.3 million was a little... I apologize to every preacher and pastor. Yeah, I think that's... uh, Uh, so as we continue, I've got a great juicy, that's rich for you. And that will be now, what can I do here, Albert? Can I do it? Can I still do a turbo news from Kim? I really like Kim's news. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So smash the like button like a boss with your iron rod and, uh, smash it for all those marathoners who smoke through the entire marathon iron rod Mm -hmm. and, uh, Kim's news. We'll do a turbo version of the news, just get you updated quickly, and then that's Rich. Mark Thompson Show. The Mark Thompson Show. On the Mark Thompson Show, I'm Kim McAllister, and we have a very interesting story. This one, uh, out of uh, Alabama, the United States Supreme Court today declining to stop the execution of this Alabama death row inmate who is scheduled to be put to death this week using nitrogen gas. Yes, this is a very big story. Uh, Uh, Thank you for doing it. Go ahead. Brand new method. Some experts have said this is... A lot of secrets being kept, a lot of things not being talked about when you you look at nitrogen gas. They think it could lead to excessive pain, maybe could be considered torture. They don't know how long it will take someone to die necessarily in all cases. So, As I recall, the reason that they've had to change the method of execution is because this guy you're looking at right now, I believe they couldn't find a vein. They right. couldn't get the so vein the going. Isn't that right? Time yeah. They tried to kill him. They couldn't find a vein. So they call it a failed first attempt for Kenneth Smith. And now, so they're going to use nitrogen gas. The Supreme Court has failed to get involved so they can move forward doing this. But all kinds of controversy over the ethics involved to to kill him with nitrogen gas. Yeah. Yeah. So this uh, is happening. The uh, the way this works is not to be too graphic about it, but it's it's called nitrogen hypoxia. Right. It's when an inmate is deprived of oxygen until they breathe only nitrogen, and that causes their asphyxiation. So that's how that works. Yeah, I mean, um, it's and it's just unclear whether there's yeah. intense pain associated with it or not. Uh, speaking of the uh, legal system. California Governor Gavin Newsom and Attorney General for the state, Rob Bonta, are speaking out as the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit hears oral arguments in a big gun case. It's Miller versus Bonta, a challenge to California's restrictions on rifles, pistols, and shotguns that qualify as assault weapons under the current state law. And Governor Newsom is urging the court to uphold California's assault weapons ban, calling it one of the nation's best tools for keeping people safe from gun violence. Attorney General Bonta saying in a statement, weapons of war have no place on California streets. A lower court found parts of the ban were unconstitutional, though, resulting in this appeal. Eight people are under arrest for trying to break into a campus building during a pro-Palestinian protest at Cal Poly, which is located between San Francisco and Los Angeles in San Luis Obispo. The protest led to a clash between protesters and law enforcement officers. A spokesman for Cal Poly said the incident happened Tuesday at the rec center where a career fair was taking place. The spokesperson said the university had been notified in advance of this protest. There were about 30 to 40 protesters there. University police were already present because the career fair was uh, underway and it was not open to the public. San Luis Obispo police department also called into this after the group of protesters started they say to get violent at sonoma state university faculty members claim they were attacked while taking part in monday's strike 
Two professors say a man driving a Tesla tried to pepper spray them in a crosswalk, but missed. About five hours later and about a block away from the first attack, 14 boys reportedly drove past the faculty and shot them with water beads. The Sonoma State employees were hit but not injured. The vehicle the teens were in was later found at nearby Rancho Catati High School. The employees chose not to press charges there. The police believe the attacks were random and not related to the now resolved CSU faculty strike. Staying in the North Bay for a minute, there will not be a Windsor Pride Festival this year. Windsor's a little north of Santa Rosa. What? Why? You think, it, you know, maybe it has something to do with anti-homophobia uh, or something? No. Organizers have decided to cancel the event because there's a lack of board members and they just put on a Christmas event and they're exhausted. They just don't yeah. have mental wherewithal. Yeah, we just don't I have say, it in us. You Too know many what? events. Know when to draw your boundaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if somebody wants to go help them out, they need a little love up there. <laughs> There's another tech company laying off some of the staff. Unfortunately, this is Riot Games. They created the game League of Legends. They're cutting over 500 jobs, 11% of its workforce. According to the company's CEO, the layoff is meant to create focus and move the company toward a sustainable future. Yeah. In a statement, the Los Angeles-based company says it stretched investments too much and it doubled its staff in a relatively short time. The company called the layoff a necessity. They say they will be focusing on games well and you know i guess that's what mm -hmm. ceos and boards and media empires do they issue that kind of statement i saw tiktok also laid off a bunch of people i mean you've got mm -hmm. layoffs across the board in silicon valley and beyond and i've mentioned the layoffs at the la times yep. and at uh, publications across the you know across the spectrum i mean digital spectrum and uh you know the written word that's delivered to your house in the it's form of the LA time Times. Yeah. 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 Well, if you want to just take your mind off it all, one of HBO's most iconic hits is coming to Netflix. The Emmy winning series Sex and the City will be available to binge watch on Netflix for the first time in April. Now, Courtney okay. really likes that, but I'm yeah. not, not a. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm a no. I'm a no. Something else coming back, John Stewart heading back to The Daily Show. Not daily, though. The comedian who, during his 16-year run as the Comedy Central program, kind of set it up as an entertainment and cultural force, is returning to host the show on Mondays starting February 12th on Showtime, uh, the Showtime and MTV Entertainment saying this. Uh, Stewart returns as the 2024 presidential election season heats up. He's also going to be the executive producer of the show. But again, he's only on on Monday as the rest of the week, Tuesday through Thursday, we get a rotating lineup of comedians who will host the program for the rest of the week. So no, that, should, that should be good. Yeah. Stuart's terrific. So it'd be good get to have little, him back. Give but, him a little break. This yeah. report, report is... Hey, Mark. Arthur. It's Stuart Santos here. Oh, maybe Santos <laughs> will get one of the days. Yeah, thank you. That would be Absolutely. good. Absolutely. You know, yeah. there you go. Gotta, he's got to do something. Sure. This report sponsored by Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. Ooh, good wine. The Mark Thompson, why are you yelling red? A favorite here at the McAllister household. Why are you yelling? Mm -hmm. They've got, though, 14 reds and 14 whites uh, to pick from and a great tasting room. And they're full of kindness and fun. Tenuta Vineyards in Livermore. Check them out. And don't forget to get your 10% off. That's right. You have to call them, though. And you have to say, smash it with your iron rod. If yeah. Say that, with, your with your iron, iron rod. <laughs> oh, I'll wow. bring both at that at the same time. In stereo. Call them, uh, Rich, specifically, at 925-699-4576. You must have a really fun voicemail. 925-699-4576. You say smash it with your iron rod. You get your discount. And then you get your wine to boot. Mm. I'm hey, saying, which one of you is Mark Thompson? Yeah, there's the, the which one of you is Mark Thompson uh, white you can order. But you can order anything from... Yeah. It doesn't have to be one of our wines. It can be that any wine. Be. That, why are you yelling red? Woo. I like their sparkling wine. I like their... Mm. They have a Pinot that's really good, too. That's not our um, why are you yelling red. We have our proprietary blend that's in the why are you yelling red. But yeah. um, but I think they've got some I, – I, I really love their stuff. So that's in the yeah. Livermore Valley. For those who don't know, that's uh, in the Bay Area. Why so, are you yelling? Yeah. 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 They have a lot of events out there too, so check the website as well. I'm Kim McAllister. This is 
The Mark Thompson Show. Feel it in your soul. The Mark Thompson Show. Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. This is Mark Thompson. Hey, which one do you use, Mark Thompson? percent effective how about that what's a little line between friends there is no defense for my conduct joe fish sal the shoemaker joe box and little anthony mo black's brother fat andy The Mark Thompson Show. I am excited. We only have a couple minutes left in the big show. Yeah. But there is enough time, as promised, to deliver you That's Rich. Who are they? The top one-tenth of one percent. What are they like? These people are so posh and snobby, they're snobby. That's Rich on The Mark Thompson Show. Well, Kim had a couple of those deals that are going down, like the st- sorry, like the Stewart deal and the yeah. um, couple of other big media moves. Yeah, Netflix is going to stream WWE's Raw. Whoa. It's a five billion dollar deal, though. What? That's right. That's why it's in. That's rich. Can you do it's the part- Raw voice? Can you do that Raw announcer voice? I don't know how the Raw announcer voice goes. Um, but I've done a bunch of those, yeah. It's kind know. of like the monster truck rally voice. Yeah, the monster yeah. truck. I just did yeah. one the other day. Yeah, it's uh, it's really, yeah, you know. Um, He's raw like, no. is coming yeah. to Netflix, right? <laughs> um, I need, it sounds better over music or something, yeah. over production. But, um, but $5 billion is what it's going to cost. It'll be a 10-year deal. Albert will be able to get all of his WWE action there on Netflix. Netflix is absolutely the real thing. We had Sam Rubin on the other day talking about their dominance in the streaming environment when it comes to movies. Yeah. Not because they stream a lot, although that is what they do, and they've just added 13.1 million subscribers for the largest fourth quarter gain in company history. They now have 260 million subscribers worldwide. And that's an astounding number. But because... They have entrance into the Oscars, Sam Rubin was making the point, in ways that they have essentially um, so well established that they've crowded out the traditional legacy studios. So anyway, this new deal, there it is, raw, $5 billion. Meanwhile, speaking of the Oscars and of movies, Emma Stone's gorgeous $3.95 million L.A. home was listed by the star. She is nominated, as you know, in the Oscars for Poor Things. The 35-year-old actress bought this sun-soaked estate in 2019 for $2.3 million. Mm-hmm. Here it is, 2024, and she has sold it for $3.95 million, from two point three to $3.95 million, and it's sold in 10 days. Oh, wow. Wow. There it is. Albert's put a picture of it up there. You can see the exterior anyway of that property. There's Emma, and there's the interior, very beautifully appointed, as you might imagine. And it apparently was appointed beautifully enough that it moved quickly. Where's she moving to? Is she upgrading? No word yet Mm -hmm. on where she'll be. I'm guessing she has several residences. Maybe not. I'm sure she has a uh, vacation residents, you know, right? as the stars do. Anyway, that's just one piece of real estate news. As you know, That's Rich typically has a couple of other big news and moves, and here is one. A Seinfeld producer listing his L.A. mansion for $17.8 million. Ooh, this is a big one. Let's see what that looks like. <laughs> <laughs> there's never been anything like this um, 
Oh, there it is on the outside. No. It's very modern. It's like a series of stacked up boxes. Yeah, it's How very cool. cool. Hollywood producer Andrew Scheinman. His credits include Seinfeld, A Few Good Men, When Harry Met Sally. I'll tell you who Scheinman is. He's one of the original members in the group, small group, I think it was only five people, who created Castle Rock Entertainment. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he's involved as a producer in all those things I just told you, Harry Met Sally, Seinfeld, A Few Good Men. Those all came out of Castle Rock. The boxy contemporary home on rustic old Orchard Road is listed for a cool $17.8 I hate it. You don't like modern stuff. I don't like box the stacked up boxes. No, no. You don't like modern stuff. You didn't like Dr. Uh, was it Dr. Dre or, no, or Beyonce, was, I think. Beyonce's Beyonce and, house. Yeah. Okay. You, there's some modern things that are not bad. but Yeah, name one. You the, don't like modern the, stuff. Own the, it. The Guggenheim? I mean... The Guggen okay, the Guggen the Guggenheim in New York. Ch -ch -ch Both. Do you, uh, really? LA, do you, right? yeah. do, do you do, don't make me call you? <laughs> don't make me ask you to describe the the that's Guggenheim in modern, New York. That's a stack. I mean, can you have at least have some style? You just stacked up boxes haphazardly. It's that, that happens to be a, a cutting modern. edge architectural look. Uh -huh. So, okay. what are you saying, ma'am? You're not gonna. We can't get you into this house today. Is that what you're saying? I'm you saying, nothing. I'm saying if if. I had 17.5 million. That's yeah. not where it would be going. Okay. <laughs> okay. And finally, or close to finally, Camille Grammer. You know the last name, perhaps because of her ex husband, yeah. Kelsey Grammer. She quietly unloads her oceanfront Malibu retreat. Oh, now we're talking. Oceanfront beach house. She bought it seven years ago. She bought it. Seven years ago, for let me tell you, six point six million. All right, six point six million. How much is Camille Grammer, the ex-wife of Kelsey Grammer's home, now selling for six point six million? She did sell it. What did it go for? From six point six million, she paid for the place about seven years ago. She has, um, she's unloaded it. 35 million, says Edward. Wow. wow. 27, says Pauline. Can you read uh, the description of the house? Maybe Albert or, um, while, um, I mean, it's a pretty impressive place. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll help you. 9 million. 66 million, 12 million. Wow. Partial, partly clad in reclaimed wood planks to provide the three story contemporary with a beachy organic edge. The house is entered through a sunken courtyard garden. Wow. It's configured with three roomy bedrooms and three contemporary bathrooms. Just over 1,600 square feet. Whoa. Oh, nice. Only 1,600 square feet. Does everybody want to take another guess? I will allow you, now that the square footage has been revealed, to amend your guesses. I will just clue you 66 million. <laughs> 6. Yeah, 66.6 .6 million? No. I, I see what you're doing there. It's not that. Selenical saying 12. William Lundgren says 8. You guys are watching it. The top floor is devoted entirely to a spacious master that offers a fireplace topped by a flat screen TV. Small adjoining bonus room can be utilized as a private office. There's a lot to this place, but it's only 1,600 square feet. 6.6 million seven years ago. Now she unloads it for the correct retail price of $9.4 million. Congratulations to Camille Grammer. Yeah. Never publicly offered for sale. She made it happen in an off-market deal. We have time for one more, or are we done, Albert? We have time for one more. Here we go. One more. I love it. Thank you, all of you people who are fans of That's Rich. Less than two years after he paid Steve Wynn, the casino magnate, $17.5 for his palatial Las Vegas residence, 
British businessman and investor Simon Dolan is letting it go. He's doing what Emma Stone did. He's doing what Camille Grammer did. He bought it for 17.5, this palatial estate. There it is. Oh, that's nice. Very nice. Custom built in 2001. If you scroll down, Albert. What style would you call that? That's not modern. Would you call it what? French chateau looking? No, uh, I'd call it faux, mm. faux, faux French chateau. I'm not, I'm not a fan particularly, but mm. uh, the um, maybe vic faux Victorian. I don't know. Mm. Inside this six, uh, six uh, en suite bedrooms and eleven baths, sprawled across fifteen thousand square feet of two level living space. Wow. There's never been anything like this. There's a double height entry foyer displaying the crystal staircase, formal living room, two offices topped by custom backlit ceilings. That's fancy. Formal dining rooms that lead to a gourmet kitchen, which comes with walnut cabinetry, an eat-in island, top-tier stainless appliances, and accompanying breakfast rooms. Wow. Does it come with that picture of David Bowie? That's nice. There is a movie theater, <laughs> a library, and duo of fully equipped gyms. There are two gyms, his oh, and her gyms. And a wine cellar. Yes. There is a uh, garden is bolstered there, yeah. by a what's climate that? controlled wine cellar. Yeah, nice. of course. You got to climate control it. The kitchen's kind of boring. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking for a little something but it's not modern so you should like it oh, something special there's nothing really special about it he's a self-made millionaire who amassed his fortune through accountancy services he's also dabbled in auto racing and aviation uh he bought this from the uh chairman of win entertainment steve win for 17.5 million he just let it go for Twenty-four and a half million dollars. Oh, wow. wow. Mm -hmm. Pretty nice. Yeah. I'm starting to really begin to realize that it's nice to have a couple of dollars to roll together. Yes, it is. It really has the feel of like the Wynn Hotel or whatever, doesn't it? It just feels like new construction. Yeah. Pauline guessed it. Did Pauline guess it right? Wow, that's yeah. impressive impressive uh that is that's rich for today more on how the other half lives these people aren't just rich they're crazy rich next time on the mark thompson show albert and kim it saddens me immensely that we have to say goodbye but we have to we've done a lot right out of the shoot god bless america jim slate big now shout out. out big shout out for that super chat. Edward Lee, Albert, who is winning the Royal Rumble? Big shout out. The Royal Rumble, Albert. Who probably is winning? CM Punk. What's that? Probably CM Punk. It's unfortunate, but yeah, no. probably. All right. Well, there's the word from the commish. Uh, Angel in the Bay Area throws us $10 for the computer. Love them Niners. Go Lions. Big shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds that like a yeah. conflicted household. Yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody, who shares stuff on different social media platforms that you saw on the show. The After Party Live is next live. with uh, John Daly live. and Kim. Tomorrow, Belinda Weymouth and David I'm Katz. I'm Shadow Stevens for the Mark Johnson Show. Bye-bye. There's a lot legal that's going on that's not about Trump. We'll talk to bye, David bye. Katz about that tomorrow. Till then, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.